Well, there's obviously a need for investigating, you know, additional nutritional interventions to perhaps, you know, help mitigate some of this disuse atrophy, which leads to uh, the omega-3, the role of omega-3 in this. And you've investigated the effects of high-dose omega-3 fatty acid supplementation on muscle disuse atrophy in young women. This is a, I mean, this study was um, extremely interesting to me, but I'd, I'd love if you could share a little bit about the study that you did, maybe the protocol used, and describe some of the key findings of that study. Sure, yeah. So it kind of maybe just a little bit of brief background is, you know, we as we we knew at the time that, you know, the decline in muscle mass with inactivity was due to the desensitization of muscle to the provision of amino acids. So that, you know, the the, the normal protein synthetic responses declined and therefore leading to a loss of muscle mass. Uh, a paper being published by Bettina Mittendorfer's group showing that if you feed omega-3 fatty acids to, to older people and then infuse amino acids, it can enhance the sensitivity of muscle tissue to the provision of those amino acids. So somehow, you know, omega-3s were being incorporated into muscle and rendering muscle more anabolically sensitive to the provision of amino acids. So we thought, well, you know what, if that if that's what's happening in that situation, maybe in a period of disuse in which there's desensitization of the muscle, we could restore that feed a normal protein diet and see if we can mitigate the decline. So um, using a, a, um, a protocol that we'd, we'd worked on in Scotland where we we knew it took around four weeks of high dose omega-3s to see a substantial increase in the omega-3 profile of the muscle. We loaded young women up in either a control or the omega-3s for four weeks. And then we subjected them to a single leg immobilization. So basically one leg was put in a brace. And then after two weeks, we allowed them just to you know, go and recover, do what they normally did. So it was act, it was it was no active rehabilitation. It was just passive recovery. And throughout the protocol, we took measurements of muscle size by MRI. Um, you know, before, after immobilization, and then two weeks after recovery, we took biopsies to measure changes in protein synthesis, the expression of genes, and also some of that muscle went to Graham Holloway's lab with Paula, where they did some mitochondrial analysis to see whether there's any kind of link. Uh, and what we really found was it was very surprising to us. Um, you know, it was seemed that the omega threes were completely protective, at least from a mass point of view, and 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 they took the edge off the decline in muscle size as measured by MRI. So those omega threes have been incorporated into the muscle of the participants. There was no change in the omega three content in the control group, as you would expect, because there was no real omega three fatty acids in that supplement. And you know, there was that protection. And then the important thing, I think when we look at it is that actually it helped the people in the omega-3 group recover their muscle earlier than the people in the control group. So if you kind of think about that catabolic crisis model where we've got that decline and then failed recovery, and this is in all the people, maybe we could actually increase that trajectory back to recovery. And this is kind of where I think the omega-3s may be very important. And um, from a mechanistic point of view, we use deuterium um, to assess rates of muscle protein synthesis and consistent with the previous work by Bettina Mittendorfer's group and, and Gordon Smith, we found that in the omega-3 group, there was higher rates of protein synthesis in it, uh, which would, which would kind of, again, corroborate the mechanisms of action of omega-3s, which is to enhance the protein synthetic response to daily protein feeding. It, this is like such important like research in my opinion, I think. So my question, I have multiple questions, but one is, if omega-3 is sort of lessening the decrease in muscle protein yeah. synthesis dur- during disuse, in other words, like you said, I guess sensitizing in a way um, the muscle tissue to the amino acids for muscle protein synthesis, yeah. do you think that could be extended to conditions perhaps that are not just, you know, full out immobilization, but just where people are taking in, you know, lower amounts of protein? So do you think that perhaps you could get more bang for your buck with the your protein intake by potentially also taking in higher dose omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, and again, that's a great point. It's something that we're, so we, um, and I think me and you've talked about this, you know, off air is that we, we did a paper uh, in younger people in Scotland where we had fed them with omega-3 fatty acids and then gave them a, a dose of protein. And we didn't really see too much of effect. There was a bit of a trend, but it was statistically non-significant. It was a proof of concept study more than anything else. So we may have been underpowered with the design. But looking back, we actually gave the participants a saturating dose of protein. We gave them 30 grams of protein, which we know maximally saturates the response. And something we thought about was maybe if we'd given less protein 
and given, you know, and allow the or provided an opportunity or, you know, we didn't hit the ceiling with the proteosynthetic response with the protein ingestion. We dropped it down and gave an opportunity for the omega-3 fatty acids to work. Maybe we would have seen an effect. Now, the question then becomes, so why don't you just take protein, which is a legitimate and, and good question. We don't need to take omega-3s, but if you are somebody who's elderly and you don't want to consume or you can't consume large amounts of protein, or if in fact you're in hospital and we know in hospital they are, you know, typically protein, protein malnourished, it's not, you know, you don't go to hospital for a dinner, do you? You know, it's it's, it's a place where, you know, the, the the quality of the food is not necessarily as good as, as it could be. Maybe in that particular situation is, is where we could see the effectiveness of the omega-3s is just to potentiate the normal response to low-dose protein intake. But to my knowledge, there's no studies that have actually addressed that particular question. I mean, hopefully, you know, that'll change in the future. You know, like if you were to give the, you know, essential amino acids or protein, you know, in the form of protein, you know, with the omega-3s at what, like, would there be even a more robust effect, perhaps at a, you know, not the saturating effect, like the 30 grams, but maybe, you know, 20 or 15 grams. Like, would you, it'd be interesting to see how the muscle protein synthesis response in skeletal muscle um, is affected by that. So um, you also mentioned that your your study examined, you know, the uh, expression of genes associated with the skeletal muscle protein turnover. Um, in amino acid transport, I think um, it's a very interesting area. When we I, when we dive into mechanism, I'd love to dive a little bit, but further. But um, what were what, what were your observations in that study? Yes. Yeah, so you know, the first thing I want to say as well is that you know the study we did with in the in the FASAB J paper. Um, you know, it's the I think the first one in humans with the, with complete immobilization. So you know, the jury's still out. We'd like to see it corroborated in different laboratories with, with in different populations, but. In and of itself, it's still exciting. Um, I think that when it comes to the, the the amino acid transport mechanism, you know, we see these effects of the protein synthesis, and all of a sudden we're going, "Wow, like, how is this happening? Like, what's going on?" And and I did notice a paper in actual pigs where they'd seen omega three fatty acids had altered the gene expression of an amino acid transporter called LAT one, and we thought maybe actually this could be one of the mechanisms that we saw in uh, explaining the enhanced protein synthesis and protection of muscle loss in our paper, um, it was a secondary analysis, so it wasn't a primary outcome, but we probed for changes in, in LAT1 gene expression. So that's a, um, a, an amino acid transporter for branch chain amino acid leucine. And we, we, we didn't, we found a trend for an inc- a treatment effect, which essentially was that there was a trend for an increase in the omega-3, but again, there's some caveats there. One, we're underpowered. Secondly, it's the gene, not the protein. And also, you know, you can have an increase in protein content, but is the protein functional? You know, is it is it working more efficiently? So we don't know the answers to those questions. Um, I'm not too sure the amino acid transport is the mechanism. Um, I'm, I've be, I, at first I did, but I've become less convinced of that as time's gone on. Um, but it's something that we 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 did see a, a trend of a, of a treatment effect. Yeah. 